Phagosoptica spectrum disorder um, is almost a, a, what I would say a new disease. It's, a, it's not entirely new, of course, because um, since the early 19th century, it had been recognized that there were some patients who had a coexistence of severe optic neuritis and severe myelitis. And initially it was thought that this was a, a, a monophasic disease. Patients would get a single episode, often uh, with an intervening couple of months between the episodes of optic neuritis and myelitis, but then would not have further problems. And in the 1990s, several groups, including our own, recognized that the majority of patients with this condition will, will relapse, typically with severe episodes of optic neuritis and myelitis. And uh, there was a certain dogma in through much of the 20th century that anybody with relapsing syndromes that are typical of MS in both optic neuritis and myelitis occur in patients with MS had multiple sclerosis as a diagnosis. Um, but there was uh, a broad sense that this was something different. Most patients did not have the typical brain lesions seen in multiple sclerosis on MRI. And I think the major change occurred in 2004 um, when an antibody uh, was discovered at the Mayo Clinic. Um, I was really fortunate to be part of that team that that was involved in the discovery of this antibody. And now that has been uh, universally accepted as being highly specific and differentiating neuromyelitis optica from MS. And the majority of patients with neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder have aquaporin-4 antibody. We've learned that there is a subgroup that don't have these antibodies, and we've actually found one other antibody that can be associated with a syndrome that can look very much the same, uh, which is the MOG antibody. Now there's a relatively small percentage of patients, only about 10% that have neither antibody. And now that we can effectively recognize this condition, we've uh, been able to show clearly that the prognosis is worse, the pathogenesis is worse. And um, we really understood much better the um, biology of this condition and, and the role of these pathogenic antibodies and have been able to identify more and more um, individuals with this condition reliably at a very early point in their disease, even before they've developed optic neuritis and myelitis. Right after a first episode, say, of optic neuritis and myelitis, this antibody test, if it's done, usually will identify those patients. So um, in the last uh, approximately year, uh, four clinical trials of three agents have been completed, all of which have shown very dramatic efficacy, especially in the subgroups that have these aquaporin-4 antibodies. And uh, we can achieve somewhere between 80 and 95% uh, reduction in attacks, and patients will be relapse-free uh, for a period of uh, up to two years in 80 to 90% of patients, not 100%. And uh, so that is still certainly one un unmet need, but we've made uh, great progress. And my talk basically reviews those clinical trials and the progress that, that has been made and asks the question is what's left to do? And um, um, Unfortunately, there is still um, much that needs to be done. There are still patients who get attacks, and sometimes those attacks don't recover and can leave quite severe deficits. Um, we do have uh, a number of approaches to patients who are experiencing one of these acute attacks. Corticosteroids have been around for a long time. Um, I was involved in um, putting together a clinical trial in the 1990s of plasma exchange. Uh, in patients with very severe demyelinating disease, including neuromyelitis optica. And this has been, I would say, accepted worldwide as, the, as a very successful uh, salvage treatment for patients who have these kind of severe attacks, but it might work in somewhere between 50 to 70% of patients. There are certainly a number of patients who are left with 
quite severe deficits if they have an attack. And, and, and sadly, we, we still see patients dying of some of these attacks, especially the upper spinal cord um, attacks. Uh, I guess the other issues is all, uh, issue is that all of these treatments are immunosuppressive um, and they're probably going to be associated with some risk of serious infection. Um, fortunately, in the clinical trials, not many serious infections were seen. Um, we know that one of the treatments, eculizumab, which is a complement inhibitor, does carry a fairly high risk of meningococcal infection. And uh, that can be a very rapid and fatal illness. And in fact, one patient did develop meningococcal infection in the phase two clinical trial, fortunately none in the phase three clinical trials. So we know how to reduce the risk, uh, immunization to meningococcus. Um, but I think one of the messages that we've learned from MS clinical trials is, is that serious infection often isn't immediately manifest and it may take several years until we really can see the increased risk of serious infections that has now been demonstrated with a number of the MS immunomodulatory treatments. And it's quite possible we'll see this with NMO. So we'd like to have some treatments um, that uh, restore immune tolerance. We think that there is a general breakdown in immune tolerance in patients with NMO. We know they're susceptible to many different autoimmune diseases. And now that we know the target antigen, aquaporin-4, um, there are uh, a lot of groups that are interested in trying to do antigen-specific immune tolerance, something that will suppress the immune system in a more gentle and perhaps physiologic way and more specific way, rather than looking for something that globally affects the function of the immune system. So, you know, I think that's, that's going to be another um, future goal and, and uh, approach that we're going to apply to neuromyelitis optica. But we, we have made really tremendous progress in identifying these patients, getting them on the right treatment and have transformed what is a commonly fatal disease um, into a disease that when it's identified early, most patients do very well.